and welcome to Movies, Films, and Flicks. I am Mark Hoffmeyer, and joining me is a man who's going to be performing this entire episode all oiled up and playing a saxophone. It's Tom Tresemer. <laughs> Hip thrusting and pelvic <laughs> moves and... I still believe... Oh, man. That, Tina Turner, saxophonist. Tom Capello. That's, or no, Tim Capello. Yeah, that's nuts. I mean, that guy, I mean, he was a big musician at the time. He had toured the world, and they just brought him in to do this thing. I mean, he is, that crowd he is something loved else. Him. That crowd loved that guy. Did, did they not? He is like a beefed-up version of Kenny G mashed with the vocals of... Um, wow. Yeah. Oh, man. If Kenny... George Michael, and Whoa. he looks like Bret Hart. <laughs> That guy is something else. With the hair of Shawn Michaels. Yes. The hair of Shawn Michaels. That's better than Bret Hart. There yeah. you go. <laughs> He's a saxophone playing Shawn Michaels. People just, I, what I love so much about that scene is how much people love it. And unironically, I mean, that's what I like about this movie that Joel Schumacher made, uh, The Lost Boys, is that this movie is not, it's not pretentious. It's not ironic. It's just a straightforward, I mean, there's some comedy in it. There's some meta narratives in here but it's a it's just an, an unpretentious fun 95 minute movie that goes by quickly and you know what's pretty wild man is i didn't know how, like so i always knew this movie was popular but when you brought this up i always dive into a lot of research mm -hmm. and i started learning about how much there is out there about this movie there's books there's documentaries the commentaries on the dvd the articles 30 years later 20 years later uh, just talking about the the ideals of family. Whenever vampire movies come up, there's the argument that it kickstarted vampire movies. It's it's still relevant today, very much so, and people oh, just yeah. really talk about it. And I think that all comes down to some of the very smart decisions that Joel Schumacher made when he took over the project. Well, and that's kind of interesting too, because originally it wasn't a Joel Schumacher movie. Mm -hmm. It was supposed to be a Richard Donner movie. My so it was goodness. almost like, yeah, exactly. It's supposed to be a bunch of fifth, sixth graders and the, the Edgar and Allen frog brothers is, were supposed to be these chubby cub scout boys. And so mm -hmm. then I guess, I guess Donner bailed on it. Uh, you know, production started to halt and it came to a grinding stop and, and Donner jumped to lethal weapon and handed this off to Schumacher who wanted to make a, like a sexy vampire movie. Yeah, and, and that's what we got. I mean, the, I mean that was a smart move. I mean, Donner also said that he had been living with it so long it wasn't interesting to him anymore. And that's actually happened to me. Sometimes when I'm doing a podcast episode, it keeps getting delayed months and months and months. It's been with me so long, the episode's kind of flat. I, I, so I get why he kind of stepped away from that. But yeah, just the, the decisions to lean less heavily towards... You sent me that really cool Stan Winston article about how the initial makeup for Keither and crew... Kiefer and crew was very monstrous mm -hmm. but they went away from that and they they made it more human and i don't know man Sh <laughs> listen it's a schumacher movie but it's it, i don't know I, I think it's a lot of fun it's there's just so much pouting looks there's glowering in it there's there's it's a 95 minute mtv movie absolutely absolutely and, and, I, it, and it is i mean just the music that's in there the listen if you took a shot every time one of the vampires laughed, or they said, Michael, you'd be dead, too. Oh, yes. I think I found a, a random article that lists the name, that says that the name Michael was dropped in this movie anywhere from 114 to 118 <laughs> times. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, if you took a shot for that, you would die. You would yeah. not make it <laughs> to the final showdown. And then just when they're laughing, these vampires laugh a lot. There's a lot of monstrous laughs in it. Like, and, you think of the Dr. Evil laughs, like, this is where it came from. And also, the vampire, so you had some questions about this, right? The Just the vampire mythology in this. So we have, okay, so we have the, the ball, uh, what, what's the word? Um, the, the head vampire, but there's a word for it. I have it in my notes. I have way too many notes here. There's the, the head vampire, and then there is the people that he has turned, his lost boys, Peter Pan. Yeah, like his, his subordinates, yeah. And you, I think that blood is his, correct? So they drink his blood to... That's what I think, but that's never really... Because in the movie, even uh, Jason Patrick's Michael Emerson 
asks Star, was that David's blood? And she says, yes. So I'm really not sure if it's David's or if it is Max's. Yeah. Who is supposedly the head vampire. I think that's one thing that's kind of left ambiguous. And maybe the sequels dive into that a little more than than what this does. I guess Which for the fans out there, what, there are three sequels or two? I think there's I think two sequels. Two sequels and then a graphic novel. Oh, man. I guess it could be David's blood because, I mean, you drink a vampire's blood. Mm-hmm. But then does that make him your brood? Uh, I'm not sure. Kind of a, it brings up these these really interesting questions of, of the vampire mythology, mm-hmm. but it doesn't necessarily answer them either. Which I think is kind of fascinating because it's not it's not trying to answer them. No, I mean, it's literally just dumping us into the world like Sam and Michael are being dumped into it. I don't think Joel Schumacher had any urge to dig further into their mythos. I think he just wanted to make. Point. I think he just wanted to show the allure of the vampires, to to show the different family dynamic. You know, the way Corey Haim was dressed in this was like a mall kid. They wanted him like a yes. mall kid gone wrong. So I think he was more into the characters, the look. I mean, he was a costume designer for Woody Allen. So, he, mm-hmm. like, the outfits in this movie, I think he was more concerned with that, I would think. And there's nothing wrong with it. And But I don't think we're – like, I know we're jumping right into it, but with this Lost Boys, I don't think there's any questions that we're asking that are bad questions. We're not – does that make sense? It's not that – why? That makes no sense. This is more, do you think this causes A causes B? Does that yes, make sense? Yes, it's kind of the, the domino effect of everything. So when did you first watch this movie, and, and why did you suggest it? Oh, man, I, I'm trying to think when I first watched this. It had to be mid-'90s when I first saw this movie. Wow, so I think a young I, time. I, I think it's – I honestly, I think it's probably kicked back to the days of kind of the – almost the young the young brat pack. Yeah. And I know Kiefer, Kiefer wasn't part of that. But it kind of – Emilio Estevez was. And so I, what I'm thinking happened with the chain of events is I was huge into Young Guns and Young Guns 2, which we covered. Mm-hmm. And I got stuck on a key for Sutherland kick. And it led me from, like, flatliners. And then I kept going backward. And then I eventually got to this movie. Got it. And it's just – it's fun. I, I, it's so different, I guess, from Vampires, too. Because, what, in 82 you had The Hunger with, uh, what, what Sarandon and uh, Bowie. Mm-hmm. And that was Tony Scott. It was very, but it was very sumptuous. It was very adult, right? And then you have Fright Night in '85, which is meta. You have the yeah. old school horror host. You have the vampire next door. I mean, but that took it into the modern era. It really did. I mean, movies before Shore had done that, but I think Fright Night opened up a night store with its success and critical acclaim. And then Lost Boys sort of kicked that open, I would say, because yeah, Fright Night opened up some doors for modern vampires, but this introduced brand new type of what a vampire could be, I would say. Yeah, it brought in that that sexy look that Schumacher was going <laughs> yeah. for. I mean, we never really had that before. And mm-hmm. during, I've never, you know, maybe maybe the MFF fans don't know, but I'm not a big horror fan. Unless there's action and explosions in it, I'm probably not going to watch it. And thankfully, The Lost Boys has both of those elements, so I'll dive into it. Now, you love Bram but- Stoker's Dracula. I do love that. I do like that movie. Yeah. I mean, but, but I, I, but it's interesting. Like I, I'm not a huge horror fan, so I don't know a lot about vampire movies outside of, you know, what came from Lost Boys and, and onward. So anything before that, I don't know that well. So just the research I was looking at, it seemed like there were a bunch of Dracula movies that came out in the seventies. Yeah. And a lot of those were also foreign films. And then kind of the eighties hit around and there wasn't that much that came out. Like you said, it was Fright Night that made it big. Catherine Bigelow had a, a movie, Near Dark, I think, mm-hmm. which I, I've never seen. And I don't think oh, that – Bill Paxton, it's huge, good. I don't think that, that did – had a, a huge impact at the box office. Mm-hmm. And so then it, it finally came around to 87 with this movie. And it did. It brought vampires into like a whole new younger generation of people. You know what? It's I, I guess I got to switch it around a little bit because we covered Near Dark on the pod. And the vampires in that movie are just basically gypsies that travel around in an RV. But they are stylish. They're cool. They, they're they cool. There's a scene where they murder these people in this bar. And they're very – I don't know. It's a very stylized scene. And they they turn this young guy kind of 
into they want to turn him into a vampire. Then there's a lady there. So yeah, I mean, but they I weren't wonder... teenagers. They weren't. It wasn't an MTV movie. It was an R-rated, like violent movie that like just it wasn't like the Lost Boys at all. So I could see how the Lost Boys kicked open that door. But Near Dark came out in '87 as well, didn't it? Yeah, yeah, it did. Okay, so I wonder if I don't know. It makes me wonder. Like we've we've kind of talked before about movies that are similar coming out around the same time so i wonder if i mean this thing lost boys had been in the works for several years with richard donner and then schumacher took over so i'm wondering if that had a little bit of impact with near dark and their designs with their vampires i don't think so like the, the, that that like near dark's vampires changed because schumacher took over is that yeah, what no, i mean maybe that yeah maybe that's a little bit of a stretch i'm just wondering if it maybe it inspired them to go younger or a little different look kind of as you said the hip cool look man well all right so they're not hip and cool they're just murderers they're basically serial killers on the road and they're having fun with it does that make sense they're not yeah they're not like young sexy teenagers in it they're mur they'll murder you okay so they're not young cool they're not Kiefer sutherland alec winter cool yeah exactly they're not that but they are alex winter i'm sorry but they are a variation like they're they're a new type of vampire but they're completely different i would say i mean they're they these ones just drive around in an rv they're not trying they're, they wouldn't woo michael they would walk they into have, a room and slit your throat and drink all your blood they don't have dirt bikes no they do not they just have an rv <laughs> and they're not dirt biking in horrible fog trying to drive people off the <laughs> off cliffs i would say and you, I, I so i so i guess in the 70s we're looking at vampire movies so you had Werner Herzog's Nosferatu remake. You had mm -hmm. uh, Dracula, directed by Bat Batum, 79. I think, oh, man, who starred in that? I want to say Langella. I could look that up. Then, but you had Blackula. You had Ganja and Hess. Martin, directed by Romero. So, you, yeah, you had zombie movies, right? But, I'm sorry, vampire movies. Now, I know people are screaming at their their radio right now. You don't know about horror, but I guess what we're saying is, in 87, the Lost Boys, with their variation of vampires, sort of changed what people thought vampires could be. Because then look at what mm -hmm. Buffy came out, maybe exactly. what, five years later. I mean, that, that and Night of the Comet. Uh, Night of the, have you seen Night of the Comet? I have not. I watched it, and I and we covered it on the podcast, and I went, wow. Like I was like, this is Buffy. And I researched it, and so he basically drew inspiration from Night of the Comet in this movie to make... Buffy. So I would say it's just it opened up the door for a younger high school vampire. Does that make sense? Like a no, that makes perfect sense, like, and I I completely agree with you. And it's you know Fright Night did have high schoolers, but they were kind of gawky and no one believed them. But it wasn't there weren't Hellmouse, and there weren't uh, there weren't father like a father figure vampire, a main vampire who turned uh, you know these little. This, like, I guess everything just led to this and they kicked the door open. So, yeah. So before people free the vampire mythology, I've talked about this a lot on the podcast and movies. It gets, it gets quite convoluted, but there's certain movies that I think are influencers. I would say. That, oh yeah. Yeah. I think this is a big influencer. Oh, man, it's just, just watching it, man. It's, I mean, they had the, they had the cinematographer from, from Taxi Driver and Raging Bull. Michael Bo Chapman. Yeah. Michael Chapman. I mean, they brought in one of the best cinematographers they brought in an, an excellent production designer, Bo Welch, to play it. They found a great location to shoot at. And, I mean, what, an $8.5 million? So this is about a $20 million budgeted film. But I, I think it. I think they do a good job with their budget, would you say? Oh, I think they do a great job. And, I mean, what's really fascinating, too, is that we, we've we already kind of touched on the music in it. But they've got some big-time artists yeah. that have songs in this movie. And I mean, it was kind of a, a quid pro quo type of thing where I think they got the rights to play some of these songs and use some of these, you know, musicians. And in turn, Schumacher was supposed to direct some of their music videos. Yeah. As yep. far as I know, he only directed In Excess's Devil Inside. But it's like that's part of the reason that they got In Excess to even be in this movie. 